right? So instead, I'm going to talk about learning controllable representations. And uh, so what I would say, just to start off, the the aim is to think about multi-purpose representations in networks, right? We all know about the successes of deep nets, but I think some of the most interesting advances aren't the performance on individual tasks, but really the fact that they can develop very useful intermediate representations illustrated here by saying you take a network and just cut off the last layer and then use the previous set of layers to give you representations for that are useful for new tasks. So here's an example of that where you can see that you have, um, in this case, you know, this, an image, uh, a network that was trained to do image uh, classification is very useful for object detection. So in this case, it does a really good job of detecting all kinds of different objects in an image uh, using a decapitated network shown before. And that decapitated network can be useful for many other things, uh, surprising things like image tr object tracking and, and various other things. So, the goal of what I want to talk about today is how are we going to produce representations like this? How can we uh, get structured? And so the, and the thought of it, the, or the aim is to think about what we really want to do is develop what are called structured representations. And so here the notion is that you have different relevant factors of variation that are going to be represented separately in the representation of the network. And this, um, and the belief there is that that's going to facilitate transfer, like what I was just talking about, transfer to other tasks and potentially generalization as you shift the distribution that you're training it on. Um, and one of the goals there is that you want to factor. So ideally, by factoring out different variables, then you can say for a given task, you can say these variables we were going to consider nuisance variables. These other ones are relevant. And because you've had this separation in the so-called structured representation, you're able to achieve that. There's some other goals that you also get, things like interpretability. Um, and another is that in, in other applications, you might want to obfuscate or hide some of the sensitive attributes. So this comes up in fairness research, I've done a, a bunch of work in that area using this idea. I'm not gonna talk about that today. So this relates to some work that many of you have probably heard about called disentanglement, where you're trying to do disentanglement via a generative model. And what that really means is that you want to find the relevant underlying structure, typically in a really unsupervised way. You want to figure out what are all the dimensions that are relevant in an unsupervised way and, and hope that the network can develop a generative model where at the kind of top end of the generative model, you'll have a, a different um, variables or different parts of your latent representation that will represent these different uh, underlying factors of variation in the input. Uh, there's been some recent work though showing that despite a lot of uh, attempts and uh, seemingly reasonable success doing that recently, there was a pretty good detailed study last year that this paper was awarded the best paper at ICML last year called Challenging Common Assumptions and Unsupervised Learning of Disentangled Representations. And they showed that this is really an ill-posed problem that you, uh, you, know, you have to craft your input in particular ways in order to uh, be able to successfully disentangle it. Okay, so the work I'm gonna talk about today isn't unsupervised. It's really, we're gonna assume that we have access to some set of labels. Oh, and, and feel free to talk. Uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not really looking at the side of the screen, so I know there's this raise hand feature, but I'd rather people uh, interrupt, <laughs> okay? Um, so the outline I'm gonna talk about is um, focus on a simple version of disentangling, not where we have many different variables, but instead one that just uses a standard classifier, but a particular formulation of a standard classifier that is reversible. And I'll explain wh what that is and why it's important. Um, then I'll show that by doing that, we really uncover a novel form of uh, shortcoming in standard networks, okay? a, a new kind of adversarial vulnerability, and then propose a way that we try to overcome that, uh, try to uh, separate out the different uh, kinds of information that I'm saying we want to do, um, a, a new objective for doing so, and some empirical results. 
So I should say that a lot of this work, in fact, most of this work I'm talking about today will be uh, work that was done with my postdoc, Jorn Jakobsen. So he gets the, uh, the credit for the good ideas in here and the good work. Okay, so let's start with a standard classifier. Um, the goal of a regular classifier is you want to extract the identity, let's say. So here you want to say all of these images are airplane images and you want to discard all of the nuisance variables. Right? You want to now say that um, you know, all the different variations that you see of the types of airplanes and the background and the angle and all these things are really nuisance variables. All you care about that each one of them is showing an airplane. Right? So our target dimensionality little d is much, much less than the input dimensionality big D. And so we're uh, discarding a lot of information. And a lot of the variability has to be discarded through this, uh, this network. And so people have done uh, many studies recently trying to understand what's the nature of the information that gets discarded along the way. Um, and one way to quantify that is in terms of mutual information. All right, so that's ideally we could say, well, what's the information that's left in the output y about the input x right? and everything else that had been discarded um, and this is untractable to estimate so mutual information is uh, very hard to estimate for high dimensional problems and so what i'm going to uh, advocate today is a different approach where we want to try to inform uh, and preserve all of the information in the input okay so we want to construct representations that in fact do don't discard any of the variability. And I'll say why in a second, but the basic idea is think about it in the, the equation. Y is your output and your uh, X is your input. You have some pairs X, Y that are drawn from a data distribution. And we're gonna say that the mutual information between Y and X is gonna be uh, equal to the information between Y and some uh, bijective function F of X that has some parameters data, right? And that's gonna be a neural network. So the idea is that the information about the uh, target Y and X will be, uh, that same information will be uh, preserved by this bijective function, F of X. So, so Richard, you're assuming that a neural network is a bijective, bijective function? I mean, yeah, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to that in a second now. We'll All describe right. that in a minute. Okay, so let's talk about those. These are the invertible networks. And I think this is a fairly recent uh, and very interesting development in deep nets. I mean, its roots are, are, are older, but the main work for this has been done in the last few years. Um, and it goes by other names, it got invertible, reversible, bijective networks, also known as normalizing flows. Um, and the reason why they're called normalizing flows is that you, and think of it as you have your uh, a vector x, and now you're going to uh, go through a series of invertible transformations, right? And these invertible transformations are uh, have to have the property that a they're invertible, all right, and that their uh, the determinant of the Jacobian is uh, computable, uh, because then you can use the change of variable form, uh, ch change of variable uh, formula as shown be below. So you can say that the log distribution of P of X uh, is equal to log P of Z. So you start with X and you transform it to Z plus the log of the determinant of the Jacobian. Okay. So you have to uh, do these transformations. And so a flow is the series of transformations that you might go through taking X through a series of different of these uh, invertible uh, functions that you're gonna apply invertible transformations and it's normalizing because at every step you're going to form a distribution using this change of variable formula okay so what i've illustrated here on the right is one of the original papers doing this which is density estimation using real nvp or non-volume preserving uh, uh, transformations and the what happens is shown in this little diagram so you take your uh, x and divide it in your input x and divide it into uh, two sets of variables x1 and x2 and what you can see is that x1 that half of the variables get just copied up to y1 
In X2, it, uh, you apply a transformation to X2 with, that combines it with X1. It's an affine transformation that has a scale that gets applied to X1 uh, and then a, a addition, all right? And that, when you multiply that uh, scale by X1 and X2, add T, you get Y2. And then you see on the right why this is easily invertible, all right? Because you can reconstruct uh, X1 from Y1 and just invert the affine transformation that you uh, per perform to get Y2 from X2 and X1 now to get X2. So, so this is uh, assuming some sort of infinite precision in your map? Yeah. So let's just assume for now that it's going to be infinite precision and in that the, the, the nice thing about doing this split of the dimensions is that your Jacobian is lower triangular. So the determinant is just a product of the uh, diagonals, all right? Because you have this copying uh, operation for half of the dimensions. Um, and because of that, uh, it's, it satisfies the properties you need to make it invertible. Um, and you get this idea that S and T, the transformations that you're going to apply, the kind of scaling and shifting, can be arbitrarily complex because you don't actually have to, uh, you know, because it's easy to, com you don't have to um, compute their determinants. So you can easily uh, just apply S and T and they're going to calculate the inverses necessarily using the same S and T. Okay, so that's where the neural network comes in. There, you can have these arbitrarily complex S and T as, function, as uh, specified by a neural net, right? So you can do that. And then because you wanted this only used half of the variables, the next level you're gonna swap and copy X2 up to Y2 and apply the scaling and shifting to uh, X1 to get Y1, okay? So that is, uh, so you do this alternation and you get a, a rather complicated uh, sequence of transformations by series of uh, doing this swapping of the two and get a deeper neural network that's going to get a uh, you know, complicated transformation um, that is invertible. And so why do we want to do all of this? Well, the idea is that, you know, you think of you're taking X and you're representing it by a more uh, a kind of richer and richer set of, of distributions that you can start with a fairly simple distribution and end up with a more complicated distribution, right? That captures the original X, right? So that's the, the aim. Um, and you end up at the top though, it's every, at every level because it's invertible, you've preserved all of the information, all right? So this is nothing to do with classifiers yet. This is just the normalizing flow that's gonna take X and, uh, you know, and transform it one thing to note is that at every level, you're going to have the same number of variables, right? So you haven't reduced the information. You have the same variables. You've just changed how it's being represented at every level. And now you're going to take it into a classifier by just applying a simple linear uh, function on top of the last layer, right? And that will then be that. So you can think of that as predicting uh, the you know, those are the logits or the inputs to a, a softmax for your classification. So there's really no assumption whatsoever about the complexity of the cluster functions here. I mean, no, no right. Well, you're gonna, well, I mean, it has to be that S and T are gonna be, in our case, we're gonna be parameterized by a neural network, okay? So that whatever functions be represented by the neural network, and at every step, you're gonna do this scaling and shifting by half to half of the variables and then swap the other half, okay? So that, but if you so, do so many of these, that you can get a complicated uh, change of variables. So you can have a band lim band unlimited functions or infinite slopes or anything like this, uh, which essentially, yeah, I mean, it yeah. can it can de decrypt encryption or things like this. Um, you can't. I mean, you still have to be able to. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can do that. I mean, you have to be able to compute S and T at every level, right? And so that you can compute Y2 as a function of them, right? So uh, so that typically it's, you know, it's your standard neural networks. Exactly what kind of neural network is yeah, open to? I mean, it could be any, any function, right? So everyone's choosing neural networks for S and T, but you can choose other things. 
Um, right. uh, so, so what we're going to do is think about this as now, think of all of that as F theta of X. What, well, before I get to that, so one thing I wanted to say is that this it was the original form, one of the original formulations. There's been many other uh, variants of this more recently that didn't have such a, had a more general way of splitting up the dimensions. So this one said, well, it would take half the dimensions into X1 and half the dimensions X2. Other people then generalized this to, uh, for example, using uh, one by one convolutions, you could have arbitrary permutations of the input dimensions. Um, so that's uh, one method called GLOW used that technique. Other methods have uh, done things like autoregressive. So some of the best, the kind of state of the art models for um, audio and generation uses something like this that's called WaveNet. And one of the state of the art uh, image generation methods called Pixel CNN does an autoregressive version of these uh, convertible networks. Okay, so they're quite, quite good at uh, coming up with generative models of the inputs. All right. Um, and so, one other thing is that some of my colleagues at Toronto developed a method of doing this that said, well, Let's imagine what we want to do is have a single network, like a single residual network that is not only good at, at generating, but is also good at classification, right? So it turns out that you can take a standard ResNet, right, that gets some of the state-of-the-art results in classification these days, and with a small modification to it, a kind of Lipschitz assumption on the, what's happening from layer to layer, that you can then ensure that that is invertible or approximately invertible. Uh, uh, the small change you can uh, have a very highly uh, a very good approximation to invertibility um, and so then you get both the uh, ability to classify and the ability to generate in a single kind of network All right so there's been lots of so that's I think another interesting direction that so, sorry sure. just to clarify so that's just any ResNet with some Lipschitz condition on a layer on each layer yeah, so it's a Lipschitz, it's a specific kind of a Lipschitz condition, but yeah, it's a form of Lipschitz condition. Can, and depending on that, the form of that is tells you how well you can uh, kind of approximate invertibility. Okay. So one thing that, so for a purpose that I want to talk about, we want to think about this as, let's just not talk about what kind of invertible network we have. We're going to have some invertible network, F, the theta of x. It produces some representation z after a series of transformations of the input x. Okay? And now we're going to split up z into two spaces. One of them has uh, some variable zs and the other ones are zn. So zs, we want to think about that as there's as many variables, there as many, uh, so each unit in the z level of the network it corresponds to one class. Okay. So if you're doing CFAR 100, you'd have 100 uh, units in ZS. If you're doing ImageNet, you'd have 1,000 units in ZS. And the rest of the uh, Z layer that encod encoding the rest of the input, that's in ZN, okay? And the idea is that those are the logits. So as you see here at the bottom, you're gonna compute the softmax, right? The probability of some class K is gonna be E to the LK. Well, K is indexing which of the S the ZS units are uh, uh, one, of, one of the ZS units, okay? Everybody get that? So you have the logits to the classifier, those are the uh, output of the network, you've just divided it into this, this particular setup, all right? So now the interesting, you can do, interesting thing you can do is because you have an invertible network and enables you to do this kind of operation, where we can um, take one image, shown on the left, the flower, and feed it through the invertible network and get Z, uh, you know, a representation Z. And then we can take one of the images on the right, say the guy shooting a bow and arrow, call that X tilde, and you get another representation Z tilde. And now what we're gonna do is mix and match. We're gonna form a hybrid that'll take the ZS from the left in the Z n tilde from the right and come up with a new Z vector. 
And because the network is invertible, we can then look at what is the pre-image of that? What is F inverse sub theta of this new concatenation of ZS and ZN tilde, all right? So that should be, so that is kind of a pre-image of the logic configuration. So the interesting thing about this new image is that when we put it through the network, it's gonna have the same distribution over classes that the image on the left did, right? Because our classifier is just paying attention to the ZS, right? So, each, uh, so, so no matter what we put on ZN, right? We're all, if we hold ZS constant, we're gonna get the same dist softmax distribution. Sorry, Rich. So when you're training this, only ZS gets a learning signal, is that correct? Yes. Exactly. So we're going to uh, train up a, an invertible network, okay, that is going to, uh, you know, invert the input, and we get this classification error loss that just applies to ZS. That's right. Okay. So again, just to clarify, uh, in principle, once you train the network, you can throw away all the ZNs and, and work only with the ZSs. Yeah, if all you're interested in doing is classification, that's true. Okay. Right. So what we're gonna want- So maybe another way to think about it is- Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, the idea is that, you know, this is by doing, I mean, we're, we're trying to get it at the more general cases that we want, this, that's true for this case, if all we care about is classification, we're gonna throw that out. But ideally what we're gonna wanna do is then extend this and have other things show up in ZN and not throw those out. And this is where we wanna to try to facilitate transfer to other tasks, okay? But that's, that's down the line. So for now, yes, just think about it as all we're trying to do is develop an invertible representation such that the, some small subset of it, ZS, is relevant for classification. But, the, but the, the ZN will be some kind of random projection from the previous layer because that gets no learning signal. But, but only that's only true of the penultimate layer. So you're saying that everything below that will get enough learning signal that ZN will have some information about the image. No, no, so this is invertible, right? So Z as a whole, this Z is it, it has all the information. Ah, about it. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's getting a signal in the sense that it's doing whatever the invertible transformation was doing, right? To, uh, in, uh, to encode X in some sense. Okay. So all we've done is we've taken in, so X to Z is invertible. Uh, that's this F theta of X. And now we're just gonna divide a subset of it and call it ZS and use that for classification. Okay. So who wants to make a prediction? Let's uh, see here. So um, if we take the flower on the left and we combine it with the uh, bow and arrow guy on the right, right? What do we, what do we expect first of all, anybody? So what, we, what would we like to happen? <laughs> a guy shooting a flower. Okay, I like that. Ideal, so, but the focus should be the flower, right? Because what we said is that all of the images that look like this should be classified as a flower. I mean, so, I mean, I mean, I mean something that looks like a flower and the thing we get from the guy shooting an arrow might probably be essentially random because we had no right maybe the background right. take, back, background take, from the beach right if you take the dog image on the right you can imagine well what we hope to see is maybe a flower on the beach on the grass okay um maybe a flower I imagine you'll get flower. adversarial images yes so that's yeah i mean you're right but <laughs> it's more fun to think of what could be but yeah it's uh um so it's not going to, it doesn't do very well. Okay. So this is a picture of how it doesn't do very well uh, in the sense. And so that we did this with different kinds of networks. We used a, a one kind of invertible network that's called an iRevNet. That's uh, you know, a more advanced version of the real MVP. We also did it with a version of the ResNet, the, both the ResNet that I talked about, the adapted ResNet that is invertible. And this is, you can also do this kind of adversarial thing with a state-of-the-art real ResNet that isn't necessarily invertible. And in that case, to do something like this, you have to do 
the kind of adversarial attacks that are known for the other kind of adversarial attacks, right, where you just do the epsilon ball kind of attacks, where you're doing gradient, gradient changes in the image such that you, uh, you don't change the output, right? The output class, you hold the output class the same, that is the ZS variable should have the exact same values. And you can do a gradient attack there and try to move away from the image and see how far you can move away from the image and preserve ZS, okay? So we call this excessive invariance because you can change the image a lot, but not change the network's prediction of the outputs. So here's an example. So if you look on the left, uh, the top row are where we got ZS from, and the bottom row of the three rows is where we got the ZN tilde from. And then the middle row is the hybrid, or the metamer, we call it, which is taking ZS from the top and ZN tilde from the bottom and combining it and looking at the pre-image. And what you see is that the middle row looks almost exactly like the bottom row. And that's true for images on the left. It's true for digits. So this is something that's not, you know, it's not like what the other things where MNIST things work fine and it doesn't work fine when you go to images. It doesn't work for MNIST either, right? So if you look at, for example, I don't have my mouse. I don't know what happened to my mouse. Anyone know how I can get back my mouse? Uh, anyway, uh, you can, so you can see like the top left, you take the six and, uh, uh, bottom image you take the zero and so what you'd like to do is have something that looks like in the middle it should be a six in the style of the zero and instead it looks almost exactly like the bottom one anyone have an idea of why this might be why is it fail so badly <laughs> i mean because there's no reason for because basically if you take the zs and apply any sort of combination of the z what's the other one zn of of zn and say x or any random hash of the zn to the zs you still have this property so there's no reason for the zs to be anything but random right so it i mean it's so zs i have a, diff isn't I have a different, different prediction here. sorry somebody else say something uh, well I, I was just going to say uh i presume that the dimension of the z dimension of the zn is much more much larger right so right Maybe it's going right. to swamp somehow the uh, That's right. action. The ZS, input. even in the image net, right, ZS is going to be, you know, a thousand dimensions. And ZN tilde is thousands of dimensions, all the rest of the pixels in the image, right? So it does get swamped out. Um, and so we think of that as there's too invariant to task relevant changes, okay? Because what this, uh, you know, we were making these changes to the image. Right, so you get the middle image and Can you look I have the engine on the back. <laughs> Sorry guys. It's okay. Do so you like these images? Um and so that the you know, so it should be that for instance, you know, that it's a dog, but instead it's something very, very different than the dog. So here's another example just to kind of drive the point home. So if you look on the left, you have an image of a I don't know if you can see it very well on your screen. It's a it's a frog. Okay and in, a, in the a rocky background and uh so the top so this is image net and you see that the if we sort the and what you see in the middle with the the snow that the black dots those are the logits those are the outputs of the thousand classes uh that's the zs mm -hmm. values okay and then if you do the soft max of those zs values and look at the top one for the left image Bullfrog is number one of the classes, and the last the last class is tiger shark. Okay, so there's a thousand classes just sorting the the logits. Um, and then if you do this kind of transformation where you combine it with another image, uh, but you keep the logits the same. So if you look across the rows, so the logits are saying the output of the the class the ranked classes are the same, but the images obviously look very different. So that's why we call it excessive invariant. So the discarded part of the signal is dominating the image content, right? And that's not what we want in some sense. So the idea is that what you really want to do is see if can we put, you want to remove all of the information that's relevant to classification from the nuisance variables. 
So this is the, what I was getting at in the beginning was the, we really want to do this information separation. We want to ensure that we can say that the, a real good job of disentangling means that some underlying factor is completely captured by some subset of the latent space, right? And the other uh, part of latent space doesn't contain any information about it. And that's obviously not the case here, right? The ZN contains a lot of information about class. So we can think of this just in terms of relative to other kinds of adversarial examples, distribution shift, we uh, are changing the distribution of uh, test examples from training distribution. Uh, so I'm thinking of adversarial examples here, not so much as being relevant to security, but more about giving us insight into neural nets and how well they're gonna generalize um, to two things like distribution shift. So we can, uh, in, as everybody knows, you get these failures, the kind of failures you see at the top is it was well known, right? You add a little bit of noise and you change the output of the network. You can also do things like, you know, change the angle of the image and change the output of the network, or you can, um, you know, do some other kind of uh, transformation that we know keeps it the same, uh, you know, very different viewpoint and get uh, a different output, right? but we don't have a very good understanding of these failures still. And I think the invertible nets give us a different way to formalize this problem. So here's a picture to give it an idea of it, a, a bit of a cartoon, but it, to get the example across. So imagine we have two classes where the class distributions are shown. One class is the red and the other one is the kind of the, the lighter colored one at the bottom. And the true distribution are shown with these uh, you know, elliptical uh, contours. And then we have a class, a classifier that has this uh, linear decision boundary here. So the standard kind of adversarial attacks, the kind of uh, perturbation to adversarial examples, are ones that cross the decision boundary. Right? So you have the flower on the left that you make a small change, and it becomes the flower at the top of the image. And so you've made a very small change in the image, but you've crossed the decision boundary. So in our terminology, uh, y, uh, um, sorry, that's on the, um, okay, this is backwards. So it should be that Y doesn't, that's a mistake here. Y should not equal Y star, but F of X is very close to F of X star, okay? But the ones that we're talking about are these long arrows that, that are shown on the one side of the decision boundary. We change the flower to the guy shooting the arrow. And those are still on the same side of the decision boundary because we haven't changed the S, we haven't changed the output of the network, but we've changed the image a lot, right? And so it really is that we've changed completely uh, in image space, uh, and we've we've changed the class, the true class output. So Y has changed, but the all um, oh right. So sorry. So yeah. Oh, what the the image is correct. So on the right is the new thing we're talking about. Y, the true Y doesn't equal the old Y. So the flower is not the same as the guy on the arrow, uh, but the output is the same. So F of X uh, equals uh, F of X star, all right? Any questions about this? So this is just the kind of thing, but it's a complementary form of adversarial attacks. Rather than doing an epsilon one, we're doing something where we're changing a lot in the input space but we're keeping the output of the network the same. So in some sense, this, this, uh, you can do this only because the margin is, is really not, not large, and, and, or at least the, your class, the linear classifier uh, is cutting the classes in some sense. In, in a nice well, I'm, just, I'm just illustrating it this way with a linear classifier, and the real, you know, just to get the picture across. I mean, in the real example, right, you can have a very complicated decision boundary. And because we're keeping ZS the same, we're, we can make a very complicated, you know, move that keeps us on, in Im image space, that keeps us on the same side of the decision boundary. The decision boundary doesn't have to be linear at all. It can be a very complicated decision boundary, like it is in, you know. So in these reversible networks, what I didn't say is that they get state-of-the-art performance the that matches it's very comparable to the non-reversible networks okay so that's the yeah, interesting but you keep a lot of uh, unnecessary information 
which you actually see in this picture because your, your, your clouds are really way too complicated. I mean, you, you don't need all this uh, additional information to separate these classes. You can actually compress them just to simple spheres or, or circles. In this case, it will, you can avoid this problem completely. Yeah, but I think, but this is just an illustration, right? I mean, yeah, in, the real world, in the real world, to tell apart images and do a good job, you're going to need very complicated decision boundaries, right? So, uh, and so this, and so to try to illustrate the transformations that are keeping you on the same side of the decision boundary, it's going to be very hard to, to picture. So we don't have a good picture of an image space of what these decision boundaries look like. Can I, can I make a different point, which is that, um, I mean, the way that you've drawn this picture, it looks like you're shifting uh, maybe a, a little bit down the probability density in terms of probability density, but I, I think the nature of these transformations is probably you, you go completely uh, away from where the probability mass lives into basically uh, you know, an area that would be assigned zero mass under natural distributions. That's my, that's my expectation. Um, but no, but what we're seeing so far with the way we're forming our metamers is that, or, or forming these new images is that we are getting to areas that are, I mean, when we do this transformation, we're getting something very similar to the guy, the arrow guy, the guy shooting the arrow, right? So it's just very close to that by doing this. Component. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So just to yeah. So just to, so so you know when we look at these images as humans, uh, maybe there's a bandpass filter going on we don't notice, but like in a, an alien who can see in 400,000 dimensions will probably notice some very strong aberrations that have happened in high frequencies, right? And so like. Uh, those will be very pernicious for the probability density of the input, right? Uh, it could make the input impossible uh, under natural conditions, right? Possibly. Like we we don't we don't notice we don't notice, but like I'm I'm not so sure that you're anywhere near the the ordinary probability mass of the uh, of, um, of of natural images, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think I guess. I'm so I think I think in this case, both for the epsilon perturbations, uh, yeah. The question is, what's perceptible? I think is what you're saying, right? So, what what can we perceive versus where? That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think that in this case, I really think this is more just a failure of the network that we're, you know, we we are shifting the distribution very slightly to produce things that are almost exactly the same as the, you know, the x tilde image. Uh, maybe it is just imperceptibly different. Um, and the classifier is, is uh, you know, producing the wrong thing. So, yeah, it could be the question of what's perceptible, but it's, there's no question that that's not desirable, right? We want to be able to generalize to these small perturbations uh, and to handle that. So for what it's worth, uh, we also did a similar study, but in the case of uh, not invertible networks. Um, and then we did this um, trick where uh, we just constrained the... Uh, the images to be a composition of patches. Um, and it does turn out even in that setting, even if you were to constrain it that way, you can actually um, find two images that are perceptually different, but then they will give you the exact same classification. Yeah. Yeah, so we've done, and other people have done something like the not based on patches, but based on gradient-based attacks, like I was describing before, where you could do something similar, like hold the output of the classes the same and do gradient moves in the input space and find things that are perceptually very different and the output's the same, okay? And you can get things that, I mean, different than what Dan's saying, right, is that you can get things that do look very real to us. And maybe it is, you know, so you can uh, produce images that are very realistic looking, but still are misclassified by the network. Okay. Uh, let's see where I am on time. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through this. So the question is how to control for this. It's actually very difficult to to control for it, but um, I think I'm gonna skip through that and get to what how how we were gonna try to control for it. So the, the standard objective doesn't do a good job. The standard objective being cross entropy. So the information preservation side of it is uh, says we so. Mutual information, we express this way, right? Because we have an invertible network F theta of X. So the information of Y and X is the same as Y and F theta of X. We're gonna decompose F theta of X into ZS and ZN. 
right? Those are the two that, that's our representation Z. And then we can either present that as the mutual information between Y and ZS, plus this conditional mutual information of Y and ZN given ZS, or the other way around, information of Y and ZN, plus the conditional information of Y and ZS given ZN, okay? And but the standard- uh, Do you agree with me that the IYZS is actually going down? Uh, yeah, so, yeah so, the so the standard thing that we're doing is exactly that. We're gonna minimize, maximize the information of Y and ZS, right? So that's gonna be minimizing the cross entropy. That's your standard objective is to do that. Is that what you- Right, what but at the same time, uh, IZS, uh, uh, X or ZN, whatever, uh, is actually going down. I mean, there's some, L I mean, you're using reversible network, but, but the ZS are, are variables that keep the relevant information, and the ZN is allowing you to invert the network. And, and yeah. the deeper you go into the network, ZN is going to be more and more complicated, and ZS is going to be simpler and simpler. Yes, really yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Right. That relates to your, the, yeah, I'm going to talk about, yeah, that relates to the information that bottleneck to ideas. Right. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay, but oh, what I want to say here is that the standard cross entropy loss uh, is just, you think of it as a bound on the mutual information. All you're doing in standard cross entropy is trying to maximize this first term in the third line here, information of Y and ZS. Right? Minimize the cross entropy is equivalent to that. Uh, and, but there's no incentive, as I say here, to explain all the task relevant variability in ZS. So it could be that you do very well on the training and testing distribution by doing that so that all the test examples are drawn IID and you can, you know, do a very good job of predicting Y on the test example. But that doesn't say that Z, there's can be residual information about F about the classes, about S, in the ZN variables, okay? And the, we're trying to avoid that, right? The aim is to have all, like I said, to have all the information about the classes be in the ZS variables, such that ZN is really the nuisance variables, right? It's this kind of pure information encapsulation or disentanglement. Right? And the standard cross entropy doesn't necessarily accomplish that, right? And that's shown up that shows up in this adversarial uh, setting. Because what we've done in the adversarial setting is that we've changed the input distribution somewhat uh, and shown that um, a lot of the information about the signal is now in ZN. Um, so what are we gonna do about that? So what we do is, ideally what we do is, well, it's nice to have a pointer. Um, so if, <laughs> One thing we could do is say, well, take the second term, this conditional mutual information, Y of ZN given ZS. We, what we want to do is minimize that, right? So we want to not only maximize the information about Y and ZS, but also minimize this conditional mutual information. That's our goal, right? We should say that if we know ZS, there's no additional information in ZN. Uh, now that will be accomplished. Another thing to say what we'd like to do is ideally we want to have ZS and ZN be mutually independent, okay? That's another way of thinking about what we want to do. We want to have form a representation of ZS and ZN where ZS and ZN are independent and all the information about Y is contained in S and if they're independent, therefore there will be no information about Y and ZN, right? That's hard to do, to do this independence of sets of variables. And it's also hard to do this alternative I mentioned, which is to say what we really want to do is minimize this uh, conditional mutual information of Y and ZN conditional on ZS, okay? So we're going to do something uh, different, which is to minimize the information about Y and ZN, okay? And we're going to do this via a discriminator. So a discriminator is going to try to take the ZN variables and predict Y, right? And then we want to make that discriminator do as bad a job as possible. So people are familiar with this idea from GANs. So in GANs, uh, you train up a GAN to try to predict inputs and fool a discriminator. The discriminator in that case is trying to tell real from fake images, so generated images versus real images. 
this is different. We aren't trying to generate images. Instead, we have a discriminator that's trying to predict some variable, some y variable from Zn, do as best a job as it can. And we're now trying to train up a, a, our, our, sys, our network that will thwart the discriminator, okay? Make the discriminator's job as hard as possible. Rich? Yep. Um, I've gotten a little bit confused. Should I think about ZS and ZN as the uh, last layer of the neural network? Or yes. is it, or is the last layer like the, the logits and then plus a, a bunch of other stuff? Right, so it's the last layer of an invertible network, okay? And with this additional uh, construction that in that last layer, we've divided it and said, we're gonna call the first, let's say a thousand units, call those ZS, and those are the thousand logits for ImageNet, one per class, and the rest of the variables are ZN. Oh, I see, so ZS are literally gonna be the logits. That's right. I got it. Okay. So do you choose what's the dimension of uh, ZN versus ZS, or do you allow for, you know, do you just like minimize like L0 or something called the last layer? No, so it's, it's specific to the classification problem. So it's given by whatever your classification problem is. If you have an image net, ZS is going to be a thousand. It's one per class. And ZN are the so remain, remainder of the dimension. Okay, yeah, I was thinking about actually probably penultimate layer instead, but I, I understand now. Thanks. Yeah. So it's really like that's the last layer, and then you're just going to apply a softmax to ZS to get your classification probability. Okay. Okay. So then our objective we call the independence cross entropy objective is this one here. So the first term is your vanilla cross entropy uh, that you want to minimize uh, the cross entropy of Y, and so F tilde of X. It depends on ZS. That's just the softmax outputs of ZS. You know, so that's the ZS or the logit. So now you just apply a softmax. So that gives you F tilde. And uh, so, so those should match Y. So that's, that's maximizing the information of ZS and Y. And then the second term is uh, trying to minimize the information about ZN and Y. Okay, and that's through this discriminator. The discriminator is taking ZN and trying to predict why. And now we're trying to uh, you know, maximize the cross entropy to make the discriminator as bad as possible, while the discriminator itself is trying to minimize the cross entropy of y and z. So Richard, I have a problem with the sign in the last equation here. I mean, I think the first term should be negative. Wait, which equation now? So there's an equation. Yeah, I'm, that's 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 this page is the chain rule, essentially. Uh, of information and uh, something is wrong there. I don't know if it's important or not, but uh, I think the sign of the first term should be minus. But never mind. Oh yes, you're right. You're right. Sorry, there isn't a quick. That that should be a minus. You're absolutely right there. Sorry. All right. Yeah. So that's right. And so I want. I added that just to kind of, and I added that with a mistake just to kind of clarify why this is a reasonable thing to do. So if you so. Sorry, so imagine there's a minus sign on that. So you can re express the information of y and z, which is y and so the second term, the add the plus term, right? Y and z is uh, the information of, of y and z s z n, right? Because z s z n concatenated is z. And that equals, by definition, the information of y and z n uh, plus y. Uh, in ZS condition on ZN. So that's actually an equation I have on this previous slide, the last equation up above. Okay, Y and X is Y and Z, S Z N equals uh, those two. And so the condition, the point here is that uh, in order to um, minimize, uh, what we want to really do is minimize this conditional mutual information, like I say at the top of this slide. Uh, but that's difficult. On the other hand, if you think of the information of Y and Z as a constant, right, because it's an invertible network, then we can minimize that conditional mutual information indirectly right, by, uh, by minimizing the information of Y and Z. Okay, that's easily fixed with some tape. Go get some tape. Go get some tape. Mommy can help or I can help. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. No problem. Right. So maybe it'd be easier to see it here because it doesn't have the mistake. Okay. So now what we want to do is, sorry. So I, I said that wrong. So, so the last equation of the four equations up above, right? What we want to do is maximize uh, the information of y and zs, right? Which means that we, uh, and we want to minimize the mutual information of y and uh, zn given zs. And the way to think about that is we're going to accomplish this by minimizing the information of y and zn. So it's an indirect measure of, of doing that, right? Uh, but it's, it's exact, but it's indirect, okay? Okay, so any questions on that or should I just I'll show you some empirical results? <laughs> no, okay, I'll go on to the, so uh, first I'll talk about some related work. So there's been a bunch of work on characterizing loss of information in deep nets, including work by Tali. Uh, the information bottleneck, it's one version of it is presented here, right? So the loss function involves trying to uh, you know, maximize the information in Y in some uh, you know, representation Z that's formed while minimizing the information about X and Z, as we mentioned earlier, okay? Um, and which is the same as, you know, uh, maximizing the entropy of, uh, or minimizing the entropy of Y and Z and minimizing the information of X and Z, right? And uh, that's different than what we're doing here because here we're trying to get this information separation. We're directly trying to have, we have this invertible network where we're trying to manipulate, not just get Y to have all the information, ZS to have all the information about Y, but also remove all the information about Y from ZN, okay? Uh, because of the, the invertible network, and that's, that's how we're trying to formulate this, this problem. I have a uh, question. Can yep. I, can I, so how is this related? I don't know if this is work uh, preceding this, but there is this paper from 2019 by Stefan Hermon that's called Learning Controllable Fair Representation. And I know it cites you quite a lot. I'm just trying to put it a little bit in context. Is, right. is that related to this work or is this work before that? So this work is after that. I mean, and so there's, like I mentioned, there's a, there's, a bunch of work of th that work and other work that we've done and other people have done on learning fair representations that tries to do something similar to this that is remove information from the, um, uh, remove information about the sensitive attributes from let's say some Z, okay? And then the idea is that if you've removed information from the sensitive attributes, then any classifier that is takes into account Z doesn't have access to things like race or gender, right? So that's the kind of fair representation work uh, of which one you mentioned is an example. And those, some of those use information theoretic ideas, um, but typically those aren't using reversible networks where you're, you're trying to preserve all of the information or where you, you, by construction, you preserve all of the information in Y, uh, in the input X, in the representation and now you're trying to separate it okay so that is there are other, I'll, I'll save something about other uh related work in a second that that is related to that okay but that's that's one key I, difference between the fair representation work and this work is that here we're using these reversible networks okay thanks that makes a lot of sense how to estimate so a lot of so something that's very relevant to this work is that, you know, how are you going to estimate conditional entropy? And so we're using this discriminator. Um, and other people have come up with all kinds of ideas like uh, various kinds of variational lower bounds um, and using different kind of parameterized approaches to that. There's also work on MMD, maximum mean discrepancy, that tries to, you know, take two distributions and use samples of those distributions to describe how far apart those distributions are. So you can think of that as being useful in this case because what you're trying to do is take the distribution of 
when you want to remove information, you want to show that the distribution of um, Zn, okay, is has no overlap with the, the samples from Zn for uh, that conditioned on Y don't has uh, is different than or has no is not different from the the marginal distributions. Um, and we've done that kind of thing again in the fairness context. So we did some work on uh, fairness version that, that utilized MMD. So that's mentioned down here below in information separation. We called it fair VAE, which was uh, so some other work that uh, in general. So one other thing to compare has been used in fairness or other disentanglement work is work using uh, variational autoencoders, right? So that's another method that's trying to create latent representations that preserve information about the input, all right? So an important distinction here is that what I like about the reversible networks, I've done a lot of work on autoencoders and, and variational autoencoders. One thing there is that you always have a trade-off between a reconstruction error with some other term, like, you know, in, in the typical VAE, you have the reconstruction error, plus the you know, KL term that has to do with your prior versus your encoded posterior. Um, and the, so you, and you always have this difficulty of trading off these terms. In the reversible networks, you have the benefit where you don't have to have a reconstruction error term that you're optimizing at the same time as the others because you're guaranteed invertibility, you're guaranteed reconstructions. Okay? The trade-off is that you have a more complicated network. <laughs> But there, it does have these kinds of advantages to work with reversible networks. Uh, so that's just a, an aside. Um, there's been a lot of work. So something I want to say about information separation is that this has been a goal a lot for many years in, uh, in machine learning. So one of the original papers I, I remember is so called Separating Style and Content by Josh Tenenbaum, Will Freeman. Um, and there they were trying to have like, you know, style and content of handwriting, for example. You'd have the style would be the, the way that, think of it like MNIST, or the style of writing a digit and then the digit itself. And they used the kind of bilinear model for this, and it was purely supervised in their case. Um, there was unsupervised versions of this that go back to independent component analysis work uh, by Oppo Havarinen and colleagues. Um, and they have ones that also look group at groupwise independence between latent variables. So I think of this work that I'm talking about here as an outgrowth of that using, so ICA is a fairly simple linear generative model. Here, because we have this normalizing flow, we have a fairly complicated, um, you know, richer kind of generative model. But using some of the same ideas, so ICA underlying idea is really about the change of variable formula, and that's true for the normalizing flows as well. And the FAIR VAE is just one example I threw up here of using a VAE where we're trying to accomplish this kind of information separation. Okay. Okay, so now let me throw, uh, finally have a few empirical results. So here's on the left, if you just have a standard cross entropy error measure on MNIST and you do this, what I was talking about where you combine ZS from one image, the image in the top row, so if you look at the seven on the far left, you take the ZS, uh, so now we have 10 uh, variables in, in S, right, one per digit, so you just take the same ZS output for that image of the seven, and you take ZN from the image at the bottom row, from one of those zeros, and you combine them and look at the image conformed by that that combination, what you see is it looks again a lot like the bottom row. It looks like a lot like a zero. If you do our independence cross entropy error uh, objective, you much better. So you get the seven, if you look at the far left and you combine it with the zero, you get something that looks, still has, it pretty much looks like mm -hmm. the right kind of digit in the sense it's in the right class, but it adopts some of the style from the bottom. So again, it's this idea of separating out style and content that works fairly well in this case, okay? Um, and I'll skip that. So here's another one where, so this is a kind of adversarial attack that we might find interesting. So here's one that 
if you, we created a, a kind of a strange kind of MNIST uh, where we have a single pixel shown in the red circle on the, on, at the top row. And one, so we just made a little code on one side of the image that's, you know, where uh, if it's the top, it's, think of it as a one hot encoding of which digit it is, okay? So it's a zero if it's the top one, the next one is on if it's a one. And so the little red circle is showing that the, the system could do a very good job of get, getting the digit right if it just pays attention to that one pixel. And then there's all the other information, which is the shape information you know, shown by the, the white ink here. Right? So that's the training. And then at test time, we do an adversarial perturbation and we get rid of that telltale digit. That te sorry, that telltale pixel. And now, if you train it up, you see the results at the bottom. If you look at cross entropy, um, the ResNet uh, got 0% error on training, but if you do this adversarial perturbation where you get rid of that telltale digit, it's at 74% error, okay? And if you do uh, the, our ICE, our independence cross entropy, the training is again almost perfect, but the adversarial perturbation, you're getting 34% uh, wrong. Okay, so what this, and the reason for this is, is, this is trying to illustrate the main point, which is that if you're able to put all of the information that's relevant to the digit into ZS, right, it will, for the images at the top, where it has both two, two redundant forms of information, one is the shape and the other one is this telltale little bit, that if you put all of that into uh, ZS, that if you get rid of one of them, the system is much more robust. So at test, you do this adversarial perturbation, you do this distribution shift such that you get rid of this telltale bit, You're, the system is still able to pick up on some of the relevant information and do a better job. It doesn't do as well because you know, that was a lot easier, so it doesn't get 0% uh, error, but it's getting you know, a, quite a bit improvement over the standard cross entropy. And the one on the right is a similar. Can I ask just a quick question? Uh, yeah. Just, just as a, uh, uh, people already asked you a little bit about the choice of ZS, right? So uh, one uh, something you said is that uh, the size of ZS is uh, sort of determined by uh, the number of classes you're caring about. Yes. Uh, but I, I guess where I'm still confused is uh, the choice of ZS, the exact, uh, uh, the exact choice of uh, which. Um, component becomes yes. Is that something you search over or is that something also uh, determined somehow? By the so it's all determined. You're basically, all you're doing is think of it, if you see my hands, <laughs> think of it, you have a network where you're just going to have, you have an invertible network and you have some output level Z. And now what we're going to do is, is decide which units in our network, let's say our first 10 units, because it's MNIST, those 10 units are going to get are, are going to be used as the softmax to give you a predicted class, and then they're going to get the error measure, the cross entropy error measure, comparing it to the right answer, okay, the, the right class. So it's you know you're going to so it's preset in the architecture that you're going to have some output level z, and you're going to choose the first k uh, elements of z, the first k units of z to be the k classes, whatever your classes are in your your problem. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 it does. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, so the one on the right. The, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Think, think about the penultimate layer as some kind of you know feature embedding for something. Yeah. Then um, those ZSs can still use all the features, right? For like, if I, you know, I could also think of a different way, kind of as initially I misunderstood that if you chose instead to be the invertible network up to penultimate layer and then restricted for the final layer how many connections you can have to the uh, logits, then it would be a little more like I want to, I want my feature representation to be maximally like disentangled and use as few features as possible that are useful for prediction. Um, right, so I think, so let me see if I'm getting your suggestion Right, so it doesn't have, we, we could do something that's a little more general than this. So uh, 
So imagine that we aren't going to take the first 10 units, but we'll take the first 50 units. <laughs> and uh, those 50 is going to be some transformation from those 50 to the logits. Yeah, so, essentially, this, this yeah. would be the it, way of kind of uh, building it, like a little construction of a network that would be like that. And so then it's saying that, so that's similar, yeah, I agree. And then you could say, well, uh, all of the information about the class, it's the same objective though, right? Now we want all of the information about the class uh, variable, y, to be in those 50 and not in the rest of them, which we'll call the nuisance, okay? It's just, we're now having a more general thing that if we could have features in those 50 or however many units we chose that aren't exactly the logits, um, right? So it's, uh, it's kind of having a, uh, a, coding, a coding layer, like a penultimate layer that codes something, some sort of features that are relevant to class. Yeah, and the that's other right. Part, right. Yeah. So we've actually been exploring versions like that. And I could tell you some more about that offline. But yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, something that I think is, is interesting and relevant. I agree. OK. Other questions? Um, so just to finish this example, the other one on the right, I think, is kind of, you know where now we have the background. So it's not using a telltale bit; instead, it uses a background that, in the training set, is completely correlated with the digit class. Okay, so we have different classes of textures. You can see that on the left for zeros, you get a kind of honeycomb, and then for the ones, you get these I don't know yellow stones or something. And so they're correlated, and then at adversarial perturbation at test time, as we get rid of that correlate, this strict uh, correlation between the background type and the digit type. So now the background is random uh, for each digit. And again, the cross entropy error, you know, skyrockets from zero to eighty-eight percent for this uh, transformation at test time. This shift at test time. And our uh, independence cross entropy has is sixty percent. Okay, so we've got twenty eight percent improvement. It's still a lot hard. It's still a hard problem because uh, you know you've taken information that was relevant at training time and gotten rid of it. Okay, so you don't expect the network to be impervious to that. It's going to have to be uh, affected by it, but you want it to still pay attention during training to anything that's relevant to the class. And so that's the, that's the, the, the kind of takeaway of what we've done here. Say anything relevant to the class should go into ZS and including things that may be difficult, like the shape relative to the background there. Okay. Uh, so that's, so let me just say with it, I don't, I forgot a slide about what we're currently doing. So we're doing something similar to what Carolina's proposing that it, you can generalize it to be, you know, one level of penultimate layer. We're also looking at other applications. So this was a particularly simple version of the information separation that I talked about at the beginning, where we're going to have all the class information, uh, which is just a regular classifier. But now really what we would like to do is have it be something richer where you can have several different attributes that are relevant during training time. So we did a version of this where, so now we'd like to kind of divide up Z space into different variables and have, you know, ZS1, ZS2, ZS3, and then, Z, then the nuisance variables. We did something like this we called flexibly fair, VAE. It was a paper at ICML le last year. Um, and that was, uh, had a, a kind of simple version of the, of the separation into multiple variables. Um, and then another thing we're doing is domain adaptation. So this is something I know is interest of, of interest to people here, where back to the original idea of repurposing the representation for other, uh, other tasks. So imagine that what we have is we've taken our Z level and we've divided it up into uh, one which is about the class, another which is about the domain, and then the nuisance. So we have three, so now we have two variables that are informative that we're trying to pull out. One is would be, let's say it's the digit, and if it we're doing MNIST, and the other one is the domain. And the domain could be like, you know, is it, like what data set is it? Or what kind of backgrounds are there? So we could have one data set that is the MNIST data set. We have another one, a different domain is SVHN, the Street View House Number domain, where the, street, the house, the digits look quite different. And we have several different domains of digits. 
And so now what we want to do is have the Z representation, part of it be devoted to the shape, that is the class, one, zero to nine. Another one devoted to the domain, and then be able to generalize. So that now what we can do is represent and classify new digits from new domains and generate new digits from new domains. Okay, so that's the domain adaptation version of this. And we're making some good progress on that. I thought I had some figures to show you for there, but I don't have it right now. Uh, so those are some of the, uh, the new directions that we're following in this work. Okay, so that's it. So the paper, that main paper I talked about here was a paper from MyClear last year with Norn Jakobsen, Jens Berman, and Matthias Betka. Uh, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you.